Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jennifer Reed. I am the director of BSU Senior College. Thank you so much for coming to our information session this morning. We will have two more of these information sessions coming up this summer. So you're welcome to attend them as well. Um, the, the way that they work is that we will have different instructors at every session. So you might want to come to the other sessions as well if there's another instructor, instructor that you're interested in hearing from. Um, and hopefully we might not have every instructor at all the sessions, but we will have a, a good majority of them. So the way that this session will work today is I will just give you a little bit of background about the senior college and how it works and why we offer it at the university. And then I will turn it over to the instructors that are here today and they will introduce themselves, tell us who they are and what they do. And then they will tell us a little bit about their course and what we can hope to learn in their course. And so to the instructors, uh, welcome and thank you for your time and being here. We really appreciate it. I also want to introduce my colleague, Kathleen D. Simone, who is here. Kathleen, do you want to introduce yourself and let folks know who you are? Hey, Jen, good morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kathleen D. Simone. I am a colleague of Jen's. I work kind of for her and with her on the senior college, but uh, the woman does a tremendous amount of work. So um, I work at Bridgewater State University on the Attleboro campus, which is hopefully soon to reopen. Um, so I'm happy to see everybody. And at some point, I'm hoping to have the classes back on site at Attleboro, fingers crossed, maybe uh, in the spring. So welcome to Senior College. I hope it's as wonderful experience for you as it has been for all the other people who have been in the program. So good morning and thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Kathleen. Good to see you. You too. Okay, so the senior college began um, with a request from the president of our university, Fred Clark. He wanted the university to be more meaningfully engaged with senior stakeholders in our region. And so in any big bureaucracy, that idea floated around for a couple of years, and then it finally filtered down to me and Kathleen and another team of folks in the College of Continuing Studies. And so we uh, worked with a number of community partners in Bridgewater and in some other communities to create what we call the Senior College. And so the Senior College is a non-credit program that offers courses for enrichment and learning for folks geared, it's geared towards folks over age 55, but most of our participants are in their 60s, 70s. Our youngest participant I think is has been 53 years old and our oldest participant has been 91 years old. So we're really excited. Um, we have a lot of folks you know, that participate in their 60s, 70s, and, and plenty of folks in their 80s too. So we are an um, open access program. You don't need any college experience to participate. You don't need to be an alumni of the university to participate. You don't need to have formal education, or you can have a lot of formal education. And the, the intent of our program is to offer a diverse set of courses so that we have something that would be of interest to everyone. So we have everything from really serious courses on, you know, politics, um, things related to race and ethnicity, racism, but we also have lots of things that are um, lighter, including um, hands-on classes in the arts. We have things related to personal development, nutrition, um, and on and on. You can find all of our information um, about our classes that we're offering this fall on our website. And maybe Kathleen could post the link to the website in the chat. Um, so we have nearly 50 courses that we're planning this fall. And that's a real win for us. When we started, I think that first semester we had eight classes. So we've really grown quite a bit since the fall of 2019, which is when we started. So we had one semester of fully in-person learning. And then of course the pandemic hit and that semester we had planned to start in March because we, we don't have classes in January and February in person because of you know the weather. Um, and then everything sort of went upside down with that. And we pivoted to offer a few classes in line that first spring semester. Um, but last semester, um, wait, where are we now? So 
since the spring of 2020, we have offered, um, so in the fall of 2020, we offered about 40 classes via Zoom. And it was a great experiment. We had no idea whether or not our learners would be um, adept at Zoom or interested in learning on Zoom. And we were pleasantly surprised in that um, our population adapted very well. I, you know, there was a handful of people that you know, in that pop, in your, you know, over, over age 50 who don't have access to the internet. And um, we worked with some senior centers creatively to help people gain access to our courses. But um, overall, we have found it to be really um, quite a blessing that we didn't, didn't expect. So our, our audience has grown. Last semester, we had 217 participants. Um, so we're expecting to have even more than that this semester. Folks are connecting. We've, uh, you know, had, um, you know, groups develop outside of senior college. We have a writing group that meets now independently using the university Zoom account, which I love. And so all sorts of great things. We've had instructors meet participants and go play golf together. And people have developed friendships. We have people from all over our region and beyond. We have participants now in four New England states and Florida. So our reach has grown and we are um, excited about the possibilities. But we are coming back in person. Um, this fall, we have just three classes in person. Um, and you'll hear more about one of them today because one of the instructors is here. But starting in the spring of 2020, we're, we're, we'll be back in person, but we will also remain online because we have found that people like the option of having both. So I imagine that, you know, in the spring of 2022, uh, uh, yep, we will have um, probably like maybe four or five courses at each of our locations. So our locations are the Bridgewater Public Library, BSU Attleboro, and the Center for Active Living in Plymouth. Um, they're one of our strategic partners. So if you're uh, an in-person type of person and you really want to you know, learn in a classroom setting, then just stick with us because we will be back definitely in the spring, um, next spring with lots of in-person opportunities. I also wanted to mention that, um, I'm looking at my notes over here. So by 2030, all baby boomers will be older than age 65. So this will expand the size of the older population so that one in every five residents will be retirement age. And what we are finding, and I'm sure you're finding in your own lives, is that the demand for educational content and learning is more robust than ever. We have found that our participants are um, engaged members of their communities, and they are looking to develop themselves even into older age. So that's why as a university, we're here. We, we feel it's important for folks to have a place to come together with like-minded people to learn either about themselves and further develop or about history or about ways that they can you know, interact more effectively in their own families or with their grandchildren or whatever it might be. So um, we can talk more about the logistics of senior college after the, um, the instructors. Um, give their uh, talks today. So I'll tell you a bit more after about how you register, what the price is, and how you actually like manage your schedule. Um, so we'll talk about that at the sort of towards the end and you'll also have an opportunity for questions. But I want to be mindful of the instructor's time. And again, to the instructors, um, if, you're, if you'd like to give your spiel and then you can leave the Zoom, if you have other obligations, that's totally fine, but you're welcome to stay as well. So let's get started. Um, we're going to start this morning with um, Brian Frederick, and then up next after Brian, we'll do Sam Baumgarten. Brian, the floor is yours. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jen. I appreciate uh, you uh, uh, being a leader in this uh, program and, and spearheading it. I hadn't realized how dramatically it had expanded until you gave that, that intro. So kudos to you and all of the staff and continuing studies for uh, making this uh, uh, program a model of uh, successful uh, community engagement uh, with our uh, senior population. Um, so um, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Brian Frederick. Uh, I am uh, the chair of the political science department at Bridgewater State uh, University. Um, and uh, my 
I've uh, worn a lot of different hats uh, <laughs> over the time I've been here, but uh, when I came to, to BSU, my primary uh, responsibilities uh, were to teach courses around American politics. Uh, in recent years, I haven't been able to uh, teach as many of those courses as I would like, just because I've had more administrative uh, responsibilities. Um, so actually uh, teaching uh, the, the course that I'm going to be offering is kind of uh, allowing me to get back to um, uh, uh, some of the uh, issues that inspire, inspired me to get involved in uh, teaching political science in the first place. So uh, my class is going to be um, centered on the idea of debating American political reform. And so what, um, what that's getting at is less so, the, less so the partisan back and forth or uh, ideological issues in terms of public policy out, outputs or outcomes that, that, you know, that drive a, the partisan debate, like things of, like taxes or uh, social security or healthcare, those kinds of things, but more to the uh, structural um, ways that our system is set up. So kind of going back to, um, you know, the, the constitutional origins in a lot of cases and examining why do we have things like the electoral college and what are the principles and values of uh, behind why it was created and how does that um, uh, translate to the contemporary modern uh, debate about um, why we should continue to have the electoral college or should we move to a different model of uh, deciding uh, how to select the, the president. And so moving beyond just like, okay, there might, um, might be one side of the aisle that favors one reform or the other, but trying to understand the basic core values of uh, liberty, equality, uh, those, uh, those sorts of things um, that, that shapes why we have our uh, political institutions. So uh, as I mentioned, the Electoral College will be one of those issues. Things like the Senate filibuster. Uh, wh where does the Senate filibuster come from? Uh, how, how, what's the history of it? How has it changed over time as a tool uh, in terms of uh, uh, structuring the uh, legislative debate in the Senate and why now has it become even more of a, uh, a contested issue uh, around um, uh, the, uh, the passage of uh, legislative items in the United States Senate and what are the arguments for eliminating the filibuster? Uh, what are the arguments for maintaining it, maybe reforming it where it's not eliminated entirely, but uh, it, it changes. So. Uh, we'll look at some of those issues. Uh, we'll look at um, um, issues like um, uh, 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 centering around um, um, voter reform. One of the issues I want to take a look at that has sort of kind of moved to the to the background with other controversies over voting reform is online voting. We do so much of our activities now online, yet voting is one of those issues where um, advocates on both sides of the uh, divide, if you will, haven't necessarily have both have haven't put that at the forefront. It's basically a reform that's not embraced by most election reformers, but even uh, defenders of how the current system works, or those who that want to make it even more uh, difficult to have access to the process. So I want to lay out the ideas or the arguments of why we should consider online voting, but also take seriously why is there this opposition among uh, many elites in both parties to to the idea of moving to a, a fully online system. Um, so um, the the idea um, of of the course is to uh, try to put aside the partisan and ideological blinders to the extent that we can and focus in on why our why is our political system structured the way that it is and. Um, what are the arguments, both pro and con, about why we should maybe change some of those uh, structures, and what are the arguments in favor of keeping the present uh, status quo? And so, uh, basically, what I'll do is uh, uh, each week with um, um, my approaches, I'll sort of give like an overview of you know the background of uh, how uh, that institution was. Uh, established within our political system, whether it's at the national level or maybe it's more uh, a state level issue. And um, as I said, lay out 
kind of both sides or both arguments, or maybe there are multi or uh, multiple arguments that aren't necessarily, it isn't a binary. There could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, somewhat uh, arguments that are somewhat centered in between some of those uh, perspectives. And then um, I want it to be a pretty highly interactive class. After I kind of give that opening, I want to throw it open to questions and, uh, you know, have the, the participants ask me and then uh, have them uh, feel free to comment on what they think the state of this uh, uh, debate is and how they uh, feel about it. So, um, you know, something I've uh, not done before in terms of, uh, you know, uh, te teaching in a more community oriented way, but I'm excited to see how it uh, uh, plays out and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, we, we've had uh, quite a few courses in the past with Dr. Michael Krizanik, who's also a political scientist, like, you know, retired faculty member from the university. And so I did get a couple complaints. People were upset that he wasn't teaching this fall. And I was like, well, we have Brian Frederick. So I think it'll be um, really a popular course, Brian. Um, we've, you know, Mike's courses have been like our most popular, like he said, like 60, 65 people in his courses. So I know a lot of us are, you know, at this time, especially interested in like understanding what's going on in the world. And I think that the way you've outlined your course to have it be about the foundation and, you know, it's not, it won't be a free for all, you know, debate on um, specific ideologies, but really helping us all understand more deeply why it is, you know, how things are set up in our government today. That's very important. I'm really excited for your course. So for those of you that are interested, uh, Brian's course is called Debating Political Reform in the US. It's Wednesdays starting on September 8th um, and it goes for eight weeks. So we have some courses that are four weeks and some that are eight. His is an eight week course and it's from six to 7 p.m. So I hope you'll consider taking his course. Any questions for Brian? Just a moment. We have like just maybe a minute quick question. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Brian, so much. You're welcome to hang out, but you're also welcome to leave if you're <laughs> busy, thank you. Okay, so then um, up next we have Sam Baumgarten and after Sam, we'll do Cynthia Richard Richardi. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Baumgarten. I've been in Bridgewater for uh, about 42 years, all of them at Bridgewater State University. Uh, going back in time, my uh, career was mostly as an elementary school physical education teacher. And I came here in 1979 to teach at the what was then the Burnell Elementary School, the campus school. And I spent 20 years teaching children as part of my university responsibilities. And when the university opted to end the campus school, then I switched to the what was then called the Movement Arts Department at the university and is now called the Department of um, health and kinesiology. I taught a lot of dance to children during my years with them. And when I switched over to college students, in addition to doing teacher training, I also picked up classes in folk dance and square dance. I continue to teach those classes when I officially retired from full-time teaching in 2011 and continued teaching the college classes until actually the pandemic, until spring a year ago. I have officially stopped that now. And one of the reasons I stopped is because I love teaching, but not grading. And I'm tired of giving grades. So there will be no grades in my class at the senior college. No grades in any classes. No grades. At all. <laughs> but, um, basically, uh, I've been heavily involved in dance throughout my life. I've always considered it an important part of physical education, along with games and gymnastics and other activities. Um, and also when I retired from full-time work, I started the Bridgewater Community Dance Group, which is now 10 years going strong at the senior center every other Friday night. So I have an ongoing dance group. I happen to like a variety of dances, traditional dances, folk dance from other countries being one of them, square dance, contra dance, I've chosen in this particular setting to focus on international folk dance and we'll be meeting one hour a week in the afternoon at the senior center. Originally, I had proposed this as an outdoor class because my community group did start dancing outdoors during the pandemic. 
But now that the senior center is fully open, my community dance group is back inside. And I think we will take this class back inside because then we don't have to deal with weather. We don't have to deal with uh, issues of surface and the parking lot, although it worked okay. It's safer to be indoors. So I'm hoping to uh, take people on a tour of the world in a movement sense, dancing dances from different countries around the world. I try to uh, choose dances that are representative of each country's culture, uh, but not too difficult for people to do. Uh, I'm very sensitive to the needs of older dancers. I am one myself, <laughs> very much a senior. And I know that sometimes people have difficulty with crossing their feet, turning, whatever. So I'm often modifying the dances, or as one of my colleagues says, mitigating the dances to make them comfortable for everybody, uh, but still give you the flavor of the dance. Um, I just uh, would would close, I guess, with um, well, with two two comments. One is I have a T-shirt that says, "Life may not always be the party we hoped for, but while we're here, we should dance," and uh, that's a good part of my life's philosophy. But I also want to share with you a quote from a, a lady named Alice Boyle, who travels around the country doing traditional dance. And after about two years ago, she wrote this article about. Uh, it's the same joy everywhere is what she titled it. And this is what she said. By dancing, we are engaging with our neighbors, making new friends, and connecting with our communities via channels that are apolitical and unplugged. By dancing, we are also engaging with traditions that run deep, connecting us to people of all sorts who have lived at different times in different places. We are united, whether we know it or not, by expressing the innate connections between rhythm and footfall, between melody and physical gesture. So for me, dancing is about the joy of being together and moving. And I hope that a lot of folks will, will pick that up by taking this class. And if it proves to be successful, I hope to continue, maybe offering one that focuses on just square dance or just contra dance, but we'll see how it goes this session. So four sessions, um, four Friday afternoons. Thanks. Pam, thank you so much. That was such a beautiful quote. Um, we're really excited to be able to offer this course in person. Again, for those of you that are in the Bridgewater region, it is at the Bridgewater Senior Center. Um, and we're excited that we'll be able to be, you know, safely indoors um, this fall. That's really right. exciting. We've come such a far, a long way. So again, it's his course starts Friday, September 3rd um, at 1 p.m. So thank you so much, Sam, for being here. Okay, so then up next we have um, Cynthia Ricciardi, and then after Cynthia, we'll do Cheryl Bottieri. Cynthia. Probably should unmute for this. Uh, hi, my name is Cynthia Ricciardi. I am uh, an alumna of Bridgewater from the last quarter of the 20th century. I have been a part-time visiting lecturer with the English department since the 1980s. And I've been a genealogist since I was in the fifth grade. So the course that, that I will be teaching is um, a four week session on an introduction and basics, uh, the basics of genealogy genealogy research and, and searching for your family history. Um, the DNA testing for the general public that has become such a, such a big thing, especially during the pandemic, has, is so popular that now you can admit to being a genealogist and you don't actually kill the party. Um, that is not the political party, but the party that you might be at when you make that statement and you wish you hadn't, or at least in the old days, that's how it worked. Uh, Ron knows what I'm talking about because Ron was one of the one of the great people who was in my last series of sessions. Um, we start off by going over the basics and I start at the most basic level. So all levels are, are welcome. We move in increments forward from basics and um, staying organized to using paper versus digital organizational tactics. Um, the next steps after you after you understand the basics. Um, the options, options for what to do when you hit a brick wall, which is what we call dead ends. Um, at some level, I guess they're all sort of dead ends, but brick wall is the term that we prefer. Um, although I have a disclaimer at the beginning of every one of this, the sessions of, of the third 
group. Um, I am not a scientist, but I am learning about the DNA elements related to genealogy. And so I share that and the learning experience with the, the participants in that session. And you, I, you also learn that cemeteries aren't just for Halloween anymore. And we talk about industry standards in genealogy and ways of sharing and preserving your family history. And I have to say that the group that I, that I worked with, that I joined um, last, during the last session was amazing. We had, I had so much fun. Um, I, it, it, was, it was just delightful. So I'm really looking forward to doing that again. And I am looking forward to seeing the new crop of genealogy, potential um, genealogists who are going to join the obsession. And I welcome seeing any faces that are familiar because it's always fun to see familiar smiles. So I look forward to having a great time with everyone. And if anyone has any questions, my email at Bridgewater is cricciardi at bridgew.edu. And I do check it regularly. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to shoot them up to me. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And thank you. I think you've been with us since the very beginning, right? Or I was supposed to teach in March, start teaching the first session in March of 2020. Oh, right. And I okay. found out after I went to look at the section, the place in the library that I would be teaching, the very next day I found out that we were going um, Zoom. So that was, well, you, that was you, a good change. Well, you've definitely perfected the online Zoom teaching. We've come a long way with that since we, we have started. come a long way with that. So I appreciate you being you returning. Um, so Cynthia has two courses. One is called Shaking the Tree, an Introduction to Genealogy Research. That starts Tuesday, September 28th, 1.15 p.m. It's a four-week course. And her second course is called... Um, Next steps, I think. Next steps, and it starts on oh, genealogy. Next steps, climbing higher. Tuesdays starts on November second. Again, also at one fifteen. So, please sign up for those courses if you're interested. Okay, so then up next we have Cheryl, and then after Cheryl we'll do Andrea Plot. Cheryl, welcome. It's nice to meet you, see you for the first time. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really exciting for me to be back at Bridgewater. I am also um, a former graduate and um, from long ago, but uh, communications, which has served me very, 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 very well in my career and in my life. And then my master's is in family support and education from Wheelock. College, which is now also Wheelock University, which is now a part of BS, Bridgewater um, University. So not Bridgewater, Boston University. So um, my passion along my educational course has always been working with families. Um, my, my history is that my grandmother raised me and um, coming from a divorced family, family was always really important to me. And my grandma was my, my soulmate for sure. And in life, she got Alzheimer's as she um, got a little bit older. And that was a really hard journey for our family. And so when I got to be with her at that time, I really didn't know about the pathway or the choices that we had as a family or what she had as a family. So I always just kept that in my mind and later in life um, became a hospice volunteer and I have the pleasure and the joy of working for the center, with the Center for Active Living here in Plymouth, Mass. And so as my career path has changed a little bit, um, really what has bubbled up is end of life planning and what does that mean? And so I've been a volunteer for an organization for a number of years called the Conversation Project, which really has brought my communication work together and my family support work together and my community outreach work together. So now what I do is I help families, I help individuals work um, to think about what does life mean? What does a life well lived mean? And how do we healthy age? So I work within the community to help folks um, really decide where do they wanna be um, in one of these end of life types of stages or active aging stages. And all the communities that Bridgewater works with um, are just amazing in this course and uh, the senior centers in your community are so vibrant. So I'm working with Cal to really look at how do we create healthy aging communities and education and learning has really gotten top of the list for sure. 
And so um, in some of the, the different initiatives that we do, we really try to help folks gain more education and more life education. And so my background and my passion is really to say, where, where am I at right now? Where am I headed? Um, I always say, did you have a birthday last year? No matter what age you are. And I have younger children and grandchildren and we all do. So congratulations, we're aging. And so as we plan for maybe college and weddings and retirement, as Jen just said at the beginning, a lot of us are moving forward to that retirement phase. And so what does that look like? And then in the 60s and 70s, um, as we all know, we're aging longer and we are way more active and we're becoming a lot more demanding too. We want to have services and community programs and, and we still wanna learn, we wanna dance, right? We wanna be active. And so what are some of the things that we can do in our communities to make that happen? Uh, so that's one of my passions. And then as an individual, what is important to you? So my class is called, What Matters Most? And so we're gonna look at four days in the four sessions. We're gonna look at today, where are you? And is this where you wanna be? Or what might need to change a little bit for tomorrow? And then what is that last day? What could that last day be? And through the conversation project, there's some questions we can ask. What's a good death? Um, what is one that perhaps is not as good? And we all have stories of both. And what are your choices? What are the decisions? Because I will guarantee you up until your last day, your last hour, your last breath, you have choice right up until the end. Um, the quote, there was a quote, it might not be the party that you wanted, right? But you know what, dance, dance up until that end. And I'm a dancer, so boy, I understand that. And so we'll look at that. Um, for some folks, they don't want to look at it, but a lot of us have had to look at it because of a loved one with an accident, no matter what age, a serious illness, no matter what age, or aging. And so we'll kind of just ponder this a little bit. So it's an exploratory class, and we'll talk about some of these things and some stories I'll share, and then you'll build on your own private way. Um, your kind of guidebook of what you might want to consider. And then the last is our good goodbye day. We're here for a purpose, I believe, and we have meaning. And so what do we want to leave behind? You know, is there a genealogy project that you want to do, right? What's your history? Do you want to explore that with your family and your kids? And that's your legacy. So they're going to know where they came from. There's so many things that you might want to leave behind. I'm working with a client right now to gather all her recipes so that she can make some of them because this is about living. It's not, end of life planning is not about dying. It is about living. And so she wants to make these recipes with her grandchildren and her children and have those experiences, but leave that behind. So there's so many things that we can explore. And so that's what this course will be to find out what matters most to you as you plan for this next stage and phase of our lives. Oh, Cheryl, thank you so much. I'm so glad that we got connected with one another. And this is through mm -hmm. our partnership with the Center for Active Living in Plymouth. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's in, you know, driving distance to that, that the center there in Plymouth, um, please, you know, visit their center. They have been mm -hmm. really great thought par partners with us and have brought a number of different um, instructors our way through the partnership. So Cheryl, I'm so glad that we connected. I am really looking forward to this course. And I know that um, our participants will get a lot out of it. So thank you so much for Thank being you here. for having me. Thank you. Okay, so up next, we have Andrea Plot. And after Andrea, we'll do David Moore, and then we'll end with Ron Reynolds. Andrea, Hi. Welcome. good to see you. Hey. Hi, all. Um, I feel like I want to take every course that's been discussed so far, and there's a connection between them all. Um, I'm teaching a class on origami. Um, I uh, taught a class um, last semester that introduced, um, I think there were about 40 people, uh, to some basics in origami. Um, this time we're focusing more on a particular project. It can be accessed by anyone who has um, never folded, if you've never folded, or if you're 
um, fairly experienced. This, this is a great project for you. Um, I got involved with origami about um, seriously, well, I, as a teenager, I did a little origami. As a middle school math teacher, I used origami to help explain um, angle relationships. Um, and that was really a fun project and I didn't mind grading it. Um, uh, and, but since I were, and I took a lot of classes, um, but since I retired, it's, it's, I have the time to really, I've had the time to really um, absorb myself in this passion. And I have been taking so many workshops and classes and working on my own. Um, and this model um, came out of that, that practice. Um, one of the things people think of origami as being a child's toy, you know, you just, it's for kids to do, but in fact, it, once you experience a little bit, you find it develops persistence, it focus, problem solving, lots of things that as we age, we want the opportunity to, ex to reinforce um, with our brains. Um, it also, there's a lot of literature now on the meditative quality of origami. You cannot be folding and thinking about the 17 other things going on in your life. You have to be focused, um, careful, um, but at the same time joyous because the process is joyous. Uh, one of the things I enjoy more than anything um, is that moment that takes place every time I teach a class when all of a sudden people go, wow, because of the result of something they just did. It's just so much fun. Um, I just, and during the pandemic, I've been teaching a lot on Zoom. And during the pandemic, the world has become smaller. Um, I just taught a class that was international um, uh, and, it, and I love the model and it was um, uh, just so much fun. So um, that's sort of just a little bit of uh, my plug on origami. Now I'll tell you a little bit. I'm actually gonna show you. So I'm gonna switch my cameras to show you what we're going to be making. Um, it is called um, the Zen, uh, I want to say it right. This is the best I can find for verbalizing the name. It's Gan Zian Bao, 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 that's it. Okay, but, um, and the translation is needle thread pockets. This is an old, a very, very old Chinese model. Um, and it's, it was designed to hold little tiny bits of things. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, this is just a practice model. You can use all kinds of beautiful paper. I'll show you something else in a minute. But this was a, 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 a demonstration model I put together. So you have this outside, you open it up and it's actually a little book and the book opens. You open into a big box where you can put little things, a slightly smaller box, which you can put little things, and a smaller box again, where you can put little things. And it makes a lovely gift where you can put little messages or a photo that's special to you, if you don't mind it being folded, although you could not fold it. Um, and there is so much choice about the layout, which at our last meeting, I have four sessions. At our last session, I'll talk about lots of different options. Um, you can go very small, okay, but have the same boxes. And then you can start getting a little fancier with the paper. Um, this, this is a... a I made it as large as I could. I had this one little piece of very cool um, embossed paper. And I said, oh, that would make such a beautiful cover. 
So you can also start expanding and using your own creativity in designing these models. I have um, seven boxes here. That's the model we'll be teaching, but you could have 32 boxes. Um, obviously it would be much bigger. And then I have a friend who, who took one of my classes teaching this and she in, ignored the other boxes and used, um, used the top model to, to decorate a card. So she, um, you know, did something very different. There's, there's just so much you can do. We will be learning the basic box, the middle box, and then we'll be learning several different top boxes. So you can play one's a heart. Um, so you can play with your own design. So I hope you find this um, interesting, challenging, and joyous um, because I love to introduce people to origami or fold with people who know how to fold. So thank Andrea. you for the time. Wow. Oh my gosh. So Andrea has um, an incredibly loyal following, as you can imagine, of senior college participants. And if I were to ever not offer a course with Andrea, there would be protests on the quad at Boyden Hall of seniors protesting with signs. So Andrea, you have a job for life with us because um, I know how uh, loyal our participants to you and they learn so much and people come to the class, she'll give like a, an exercise for them to just know ahead of time and they all come to the class with it already done. And she has to like pivot and like figure out what she's going to do because everyone is so enthusiastic and you don't have to be that enthusiastic to attend, but um, she really, you, you know, it's a you. treasure. And I know that our participants get so much. I get lovely emails about your class all the time. Oh, I'm so glad. And, and don't be afraid to try something really new. Um, I'm, I'm, I have, I've, I've probably taught 20 classes um, on Zoom and I can make it work. And if you're struggling, I can, I can help. And the way so. that you've embraced technology is just A plus, you know, the two cameras set up, it's just amazing. I'm super proud of us that we have an instructor that's so embracing of technology. So Andrea's class, Playful, Bookbinding, Origami, and the uh, Zen, Zhao, Bao, I know I butchered that, Thread Book, um, Mondays starting on October 18th at 10 a.m. So consider that course. Okay, so up next, I think we said David Moore and then Ron Reynolds. David. And you have to unmute, David. Okay. I got a dog here and he likes to jump in on a conversation. So I got to keep it mute once in a while. Okay. Uh, I've been working with Bridgewater history, uh, talking with people about it for about 45 years. I started with my dad, uh, who was uh, a very, uh, it was his hobby and uh, he picked it up from his dad. So we've been involved in Bridgewater history, both living in Bridgewater and talking about it for close to a hundred years. So, I have uh, a large collection of uh, slides and the class that I did back in the fall of 2019, we, uh, we had about 25 people and I, I did it uh, chronologically, uh, starting with the very first uh, settlement of Bridgewater in, in uh, probably between 1636 and 1656. And we worked up from there. And then in later years, we focused on different aspects, industrial history, education, uh, religion, and so forth, and mainly the structures. But I, I don't profess to be a, uh, an authority on Bridgewater history. I consider myself a student of Bridgewater history. So in these classes, I'm always looking to have discussions. <clears throat> uh, I'm always open to learning something different. Uh, I've had instances where I was talking uh, one particular day about the uh, LQ white shoe factory in Bridgewater, had over 5,000 people working in it at a time where the population of Bridgewater wasn't much bigger than 5,000. And I had two people uh, speak up and say that they worked there as a young, uh, young woman. And then another man said that he was there and threw the switch when the place went out of business in uh, 1933. So it's, uh, it, it's always great when we can get uh, personal interaction. 
and get people talking about their experiences, uh, people they've known, grandparents or, or relatives or neighbors or whatever. And we try to add a lot of uh, personal stories because Bridgewater, I have pictures of buildings. I like to bring in the people and, and what made Bridgewater what it is. It's the people that make the town. So uh, looking forward to it again. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll all have a good time. David, thank you so much. Um, David's course, It Happened in Bridgewater, is on Thursdays starting November 4th from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. And um, I know you have a loyal following of folks in the town. And I wish we could find the David Moore of every town. So if you know if you know the equivalent of David Moore in a different town, please send that him or her my way. Um, I know people really enjoy learning about where they li live or if they live nearby, or even if they just have an interest in the history of our, our little communities here in Massachusetts. So thank you for being here, David. Um, okay, up next final is Ron Reynolds. Hi, buddy. Hi, Ron. So good to see you. Hi. Hello, everybody. Am I on camera or what? I can't tell. You're perfect. We can hear you. Okay. We can see you. Yep. Yeah, I, I also am a Bridgewater alumnus. Uh, I graduated in the class of 61. What, when I started there, it was still that. the That's State awesome. Teachers College. And teaching there in recent years is mind-boggling to see the growth. It's really impressive. Uh, I taught high school for 42 years, and then after a stroke, I retired. And after some recovery, I was invited to come down to the college at that time and teach two, two hours a week. And uh, that has grown over time, and uh, I'm going into my 18th year. I'm quite excited I'm going to be back on campus in January. So uh, I'm particularly interested in this course, though, because as Sam uh, pointed out earlier, there's no grades. I don't have to correct papers. And for the first time ever, all of the students will be people who want to be there. Now, I noticed last year that there weren't any science offerings. and All the courses they had were fine. I took a bunch of them and had a ball. But I noticed that there weren't any science offerings. So I made a proposal to Jen uh, to think about. And what I'm envisioning, hopefully, is over time, a series of courses uh, under the umbrella of how the earth works. And what I want to do in the introductory course that I'm offering in October is I want to start out looking at ancient cultures uh, and Stonehenge and the Anasazi of uh, the Southwest and all at how they looked at the skies and then progress to uh, the Greek thought, um, how they were deceived into assuming that what you see is what you get. And uh, they thought that everything revolved around the earth, which of course we now know today is completely wrong. So I want to look at that and how, how Ptolemy's theory worked out and all. And uh, it's interesting to note too, that as much as 2000 years before the present, we actually knew the size of the earth. And it was more widely believed that the earth is round than many people think. Um, I remember in elementary school, I was taught that Columbus must have been a very brave man because everybody thought that he'd sail off the edge of the earth and fall into nothing. And actually uh, going back to the time of the Greeks, they believed the earth was round. And it was one of the Greeks that came up with a really clever experiment <clears throat> where he estimated the size of the earth. And he was amazingly close to the present day value. Uh, it's, a, it's amazing what you can do with some geometry. And I want to look at that. And then I want to ultimately progress to the Copernican model of the universe and how that had to have been modified with the work of Kepler and Tycho Brahe. So there'd be a mixture of some, some history and some science. <clears throat> and then if time allows, I also want to look at uh, the phases of the moon and how the moon orbits the earth. <clears throat> and as time progresses, if we continue to go on, I'd like to look at forces and how they affect things, particularly what a lot of us physicists call phony forces. Uh, there's a lot of things that we perceive as forces that really aren't there. 
And uh, I also want to take some of the experience that I've had with NASA and ultimately talk about eating, living, and traveling in space. And I think that pretty well sums up what I'd like to do. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Ron. We're so happy to have you as such an engaged member of our community and now instructor, um, and especially, especially given all the wealth of experience you bring as an instructor at the university and as a high school teacher as well. So your course, How the Earth Works, it starts on Thursday, October 7th from 2 to 3 p.m. So thank you so much. Um, okay, so how does senior college work? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Um, there are, like I said, over uh, just about 50 courses this fall. Some are four weeks, some are eight weeks. For a single fee of $85, you can take as many courses as you like. I'm not, I, that's not a joke. I'm being completely clear, you could take 50 courses if you wanted to um, for $85. So most of our people take anywhere between usually around five courses, but you can take just one or you could take 20. It's really up to you, um, but it is incredibly affordable, especially when you compare it to our regional um, competitors like the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute at um, UMass Boston. A single course there is $85, um, similar to the Cape Cod, um, the Lifelong Learning Institute of Cape Cod. We have, um, you know, I have a relationship with them. They've been great mentors to me. But again, their, their model's quite different. You know, a single course is like $45. Um, and they have and most of these programs also have like a membership fee. So ours um, is so affordable and that really is a testament to the leaders of the university. Um, Kathleen and I don't take credit for that. It is such a strong commitment of our president, Fred Clark, our provost, Ismale. They um, feel that this is such an important program that they are you know, willing to support it financially. And so the, the, the fee that we do charge just co covers the nominal fee that we, uh, the stipend that we give our instructors. So I won't belabor that point, but it really is um, quite affordable. The other thing is if you can't afford the fee, then just shoot me an email and let me know. And we have a scholarship program. So I'm putting my email in the chat, or if you have a friend that could, you know, really benefit or would be interested in this program and you think him or her might, you know, might be a financial um, issue, just have them email me because we have um, scholarships, no questions asked, and um, luckily we're able to be really generous with that. So um, hopefully that explains the cost. You do need to register on our website. We do have a very complicated three-step registration process because, you know, we're a university. We like to keep things super complicated. So step one is you actually do have to sort of apply with the university. Um, so it's a form on our website that you click on and fill out. And then step two is you go to another website to pay. Um, you know, we're just keeping you on your toes, you know, because we, we don't have busy lives. And then step three is actually selecting your courses. Um, so once you select your courses, you will receive an email from me or Kathleen or another uh, or no other colleague, Darlene, with the Zoom link. You usually will receive the Zoom link about a week before your class um, or even just a few days before your class. And then it really is up to you to keep yourself organized. So you do have to keep the um, email with that original Zoom link because you will use it every week to log into your class. So it's the same Zoom link for every class. So if you took, um, you know, the nutrition course with Kathleen LaQuale, you would get a single email with the link and then every week you would go back to that email and log in. Although some people I do notice they just they keep the Zoom ID number, they write that down, they have like a notebook. So that's another way to um, manage your time and you know how you access classes. We're having an event called um, What is Senior College on Monday, July 19th, 4 to 5 p.m. In that event, I will talk a little bit more in depth with how to keep yourself organized if you're taking multiple classes. So if you want to attend that event, you can um, sign up on our website for that. And again, we'll have two more information sessions, one on Wednesday, August 11th at 6 p.m. And again, it'll be a whole new group of instructors. And then on Monday, August 23rd at 2 p.m. 
um, again, different group of faculty. Um, but I know we have a few minutes less left. So if there's any people um, in the chat, if you're here and you're brand new to the college, uh, to the senior college, can you just write in the chat your name and where you're from? And then if you have any questions, we are, we're wide open. I have a question. Oh, sure, Cynthia. Uh, the July 19th event, is that on campus or Zoom? Zoom, it's via Zoom, yep. Good question. Any other questions? Esther from uh, Sharon, welcome. Is there anyone that's uh, brand new and has never been a member of the senior college in the event today? All right, Stephen, I see Stephen, Barbara, uh, Esther is brand new, welcome. Well, I hope that you'll consider joining and um you know again if you have any questions or if you want to chat with me individually i'm happy to do that um my email's right here in the chat it's uh j5read at bridgew.edu um any any questions wow we're at 11 uh, oh esther go ahead uh, when can we start to register for classes anytime so we're, we opened uh registration on june 1st Oh. And there's a couple classes that have limited enrollment. So especially the, um, the introduction to American Sign Language. So if that's a course you're interested in, you have to sign up like today because it's just about full. Um, but all the other courses are still wide open. Um, I think there was maybe one other class with a limited enrollment, which I can't remember, but I think we're doing um, good. Uh, with that. Okay, so I see we have um, T Gen X. Welcome. Good to see you. I, your name just says owner. Um, oh, Ed. Oh, welcome to your new to senior ed. So welcome. Yep. If I can put you on our mailing list if you want the folks that folks that are here. Any other questions or comments or something you're looking forward to? I know what I'm looking forward to. I am looking forward to seeing a lot of you back in person. Um, so just look forward to that, you know, stay engaged with us. I think the spring of 2022 is going to be a real banner situation for us because we will have likely, you know, four to six classes in each location and then also online learning. So it's really a great opportunity to meet people. Um, that first semester we had folks that connected with one another and you know we saw robust conversations happening after classes people were going to get coffee and lunch and you know it's a great way to meet people too if that's something of that you're interested in um, I know all of us struggle as adults with making you know new relationships with folks the other thing I would recommend to you is if you have a friend who lives somewhere else outside of our region have them join too. And then you can like be in a class together. You know, I think that's also a fun way to connect with folks. We've had some people do that, like someone's cousin lived in Florida. And so she had her join and then they took classes together and it was a great way for them to connect and have something to talk about. All right, Kathleen, did I miss anything? Is there anything else I should be adding? this okay well uh, no well let me just say one ahead. one more thing if i could if yeah. you liked what you heard share the word yeah. our yeah. students are our best recruiters so yes. uh, guess how much our marketing budget is <laughs> yeah <laughs> So please <laughs> spread the word. Yes. So word of mouth is the most critical, um, you know, thing to our marketing. So if you enjoy the program, tell a friend. And again, you don't have to join, you know, right in September. You know, if there, you know, people can be joining all the way up until we, you know, stop offering classes. So our our last course in the fall doesn't doesn't start until November 18th. So even if you start in September, you can still be telling your friends, neighbors, and family members about us the whole semester because there's they can be joining all the way through till November. Um, so thank you. Well, it was great to see you all and hopefully I'll see you soon. If you have any questions, reach out. We're here. Thanks instructors for being here. Have a great day. Bye everyone. Thank you.